members of the bank, not just our customers, but our partners um, and the broader business community. So uh, this event's a really good example of that, and that's what I'll try to do in the next quarter of an hour or so. Um, look, I, I do need to, I suppose, start with the confronting reality that um, not only that we're in our first recession for 29 years, but it is actually going to be the deepest economic contraction since World War II and the, the pain and, and impact of that around Australia and around the world is clearly visible uh, through uh, individuals, through businesses and, and through families. So the impact on aged care here in Victoria in particular has been quite shocking. Um, but I think it's important to mention, you know, economically, we do expect a recession or a crisis of some sort every decade or so. That seems to be the run rate. Um, can't say that I saw a global pandemic coming, but uh, this, of course, is a health crisis, not a financial crisis. And I think there are there's an important distinction with what we had to deal with 10 or 11 years ago. Of course, the epicentre of the, that health crisis started in Asia, it moved to Europe, and it's now in North America. Uh, hard to believe that today, you know, about a quarter of the cases are in the United States, and it's devastated the world's largest economy. But for Australia, it's Unlike in the GFC, where our economy went backwards by about half of a percent uh, in GDP terms, this time it's going to be contracting by 5 to 10 percent, so 10 to 20 times the impact. Um, but that's what happens when you close down an economy, when you have to, to deal with the, uh, the health crisis. The question is now, having had that contraction, uh, what's the shape of the recovery going to look like uh, and how quickly can we recover? Um, so to run through some, some slides again, um, uh, starting off at a, a global level and then I'll come down to national and, and locally. But, you, you know, it is almost warlike fiscal measures that we've been hearing. The budget deficit last year was the same as GFC, but for the new um, financial year, it's going to be the uh, largest deficit since World War II. Um, but it's all about COVID. And so, you know, just starting with the morbid reality of it, the uh, 18 million cases around the world today, uh, and as I said before, a quarter in the US. Uh, you know, six months ago, we'd heard of the virus, but it really wasn't until probably the last few days of February, maybe the first day of March, that we started to see the cases outside of, of China. And that was when the language of a global pandemic first really kicked off. And I think this chart shows a couple of things. Firstly, the exponential growth in it all, but also how much of the um, damage has been done in Europe and North America uh, and comparatively, how much less has occurred in, in Asia and China and also in Oceania, where we are. So, you know, 60% of the world's population is in Asia and uh, it's not 60% of the, the cases there, as you can see. So it was really countries that were fastest and most decisive with their policy response, both health and, health and fiscal policies that have managed to uh, limit the damage. And, and I would include Australia in that category. Um, of course, the numbers over the last few weeks have been very disappointing, mainly out of Victoria. And the uh, the chart there shows that actually we've got more daily reported numbers than, um, than back in the first wave. Um, so despite the fact that Australia's got really low rates on a per capita basis, um, what is just absolutely vital today is that this second lockdown in Melbourne, the stage four restrictions, the curfew um, does actually work so that the economy can reopen here as has already commenced in other parts of Australia. So, you know, 20% of Australians are, are back in lockdown. We need to make sure that it stays at only 20% and, and limit the outbreak to there. Um, and, you know, to the, to the extent the clusters are being seen elsewhere that they're, that they're contained. But, you know, what, why do I mention all of this? Well, you know, the, the, the link between COVID and the economy, is, I think this chart on the top right there um, sums it up pretty well. If it were a single hit scenario, and we've pretty much already had that first hit, then you can see the trajectory of the recovery in blue there. It, it really is a V-shape, um, and that's consistent with some of the other data we've been seeing. But if it really is a double hit, um, then the V becomes a W. And, you know, I think that really shows what's at stake with the lockdown in, in Melbourne at the moment and avoiding similar events elsewhere. So, you know, when you deliberately shut down an economy as you have to for a health crisis, it's a case of how quickly you can reopen it to avoid more permanent damage. So look, just uh, going around the grounds, so I'll start with China uh, before I come back to the Australian outlook. Um, but for China, our largest trading partner and 39% of our exports go to China. 
Um, so it's pretty important how things are going there. It absolutely is a V-shaped recovery in China and, um, you know, their GDP fell 10% in the first quarter, but then rose 11.5% in the second quarter. And that recovery has been especially in industry and construction to a lesser extent for retail and services, but, but it's a, a massive V-shape. And I know there is some skepticism about some of the numbers we get about out of China uh, with their economy. But actually, if you look at some of the um, recent survey figures, the independent numbers were worse than, uh, sorry, were uh, more benign than the official numbers. So I actually do trust the numbers that we're, we're seeing out of China. And you can see with that chart there that we're now back to pre-COVID levels when it comes to manufacturing. Uh, as for Australia, well, our trading relationship with China is pretty tense, isn't it? We're a bit wedged between our relationship with um, the US and uh, and our trade relationship with China, but the latest trade numbers were actually record highs. Uh, and that's, that chart shows um, goods as opposed to services, but they've continued to increase. And I think clearly the iron ore price has helped there, um, but really Chinese policy stimulus is both helping the Chinese economy and indirectly helping our economy. The trick will be how we um, keep that going with respect to tourism and education in the, in the years ahead. So pretty strong, the recovery in China. In contrast, though, in the United States, um, and, and I think the best way to monitor what's happening in the States um, is just to look at the total number of people employed. And that's what this chart shows here in red. Um, so if you go back to the start of the century, go back 20 years ago, 136 million Americans in a job. Uh, that rose to 146 million. Then you had the GFC. Then it rose again over the last decade to 159 million Americans with a job. And then bang, all of those jobs gained over the last 20 years and more gone in three months. Um, so good to see a little bit of a bounce, but the US unemployment rate is 11% and it's hard to believe it was 3.5% in February, just extraordinary. But I'd like to contrast how damaging this has been for, the, for North America um, or for the US in particular with the same chart for Australia. So there's Australia's uh, total employment using the right hand scale there and 9 million Australians with a job at the start of the um, uh, century steadily rose, didn't fall during the GFC, steadily rose to 13 million by February and then we had COVID-19. So that 13 million became 12.1 million fairly quickly, now back up to 12.3. So Firstly, I think that the relativities are important. And to my earlier point, I think, you know, the countries that weren't decisive in their policy response are going to play years of catching up. And for that, I'm including the US, uh, UK and European Union. Um, but the comparison there with Australia, our, our local outlook, um, so far, we've actually coped pretty well. And let's just look at that purple line in a bit more detail. So um, I said, Total employed numbers across all of Australia has fallen from 13 million to 12.1 million, back up to 12.33. The question is where that heads from here. Um, total employment is one measure, and I think it's a more accurate measure than just the unemployment rate. Uh, another measure is total hours worked. That's fallen 10%. Um, but keep in mind, in the US, it fell 20%. In Canada, it's fallen 29%. Jeez. So... So far, we've managed to, uh, I suppose, support the economy through fiscal stimulus. Um, that 10% fall in hours worked isn't across the board. It's been very much uh, industry by industry. Clearly, hospitality, uh, accommodation, food services, arts and rec have been hardest hit, and they've need the most support, uh, which is why it's good that the government's fiscal package is, is targeted. Um, other parts have coped better, retail, under other there, we've got sort of construction, uh, some of the essential services, healthcare and education, um, and, you know, they've managed to hang in there. Um, but it's it's not quite as simple as just looking um, on a uh, industry by industry perspective, then you've got the region by region perspective. And this is where you start to see Victoria falling behind because of our second shut down. So here's some stats that just came out the other day. They're um, up to date to the 11th of July. And what they show is that uh, whereas 
total job numbers have fallen by about five and a half percent across Australia, 5.3% for New South Wales, but 7.3% for Victoria. And you can see that uh, clearly that's going to be um, a trend that is likely to, to continue and that, that may widen in the, in the months ahead. So that's the jobs market. Um, it, you know, I, I think if we look at the sort of business confidence uh, and consumer confidence and the, uh, the reaction to the initial shutdowns, clearly that all collapsed in May, but has bounced back pretty aggressively through May and June. Um, you can see the impact there was larger during the, uh, during the last few months than the, the GFC. The question is, will that uh, regaining of confidence continue from here? And my comment would simply be those states and regions that are able to remain open will continue to see people getting back to work and spending and the regions where you, they've had to shut down, uh, you, you'll see a reverse in direction. And so just to round that out, retail sales today are actually 8% higher than they were a year ago. So that's the cumulative benefit of five interest rate cuts from the Reserve Bank in the last year, 10% of GDP being thrown at the economy by the, the federal government. Um, sure, it was more food than non-food initially when people were hoarding, but that's all heading in the right direction at the moment. The other comment I'd make, and, and the second chart on the right there, I think restaurant activity um, and consumer sort of discretionary spending is a good sign of, of where this is all heading. That has recovered strongly through New South Wales, Queensland, but you can see Victoria going in the other direction and it's obvious why that's the case. So where to from here, you know, the unemployment rate's likely to hit about 8% um, for Victoria, that's likely to be closer to 11%, but for New South Wales, we've penciled in uh, around about a 7% unemployment rate. And again, there's just a chart which shows that divergence between what's happening in Victoria and, and what's happening in New South Wales. And that risk of a W shape uh, to the extent that these shutdowns need to be con continued or lockdowns, I should call them. So that's the, um, the jobs market. Look, I, I won't talk about property for more than a moment, but just to note that obviously there are um, concerns about the property market where unemployment is rising. Uh, I think you do need to look at the long term trends here. There's a 20 year chart showing the capital cities. And yes, we had the um, the peak in 2016-17, then we had the fall because of the tightening in lending standards and then the recovery. Um, you know, my personal view is you're likely to get a bit of a dip more so in Victoria than elsewhere, but great opportunity for first home owners to get on board in this dip. So we'll, we'll see where that all trends. And I just saw some data out this morning um, from CoreLogic from their website. and. That does show, again show that Melbourne is bearing the brunt of this. It also shows that regional property prices are holding up very well, which is an, an interesting trend. Um, but look, just to oh sorry, and the, the other comment I'd make is, I know Occupy is is performing pretty strongly, but the investor side has um, has clearly been hit hardest by virtue of COVID nineteen. So look, just to conclude, um, you know we're in a recession. Hopefully, the second quarter was the low point in April. Uh, now it's all about the recovery. We get a recession every 10 years or so. Here's a list of some of them over the last 100 years, a list of why they occurred. This one, uh, COVID-19, the one 100 years ago, similarly, Spanish flu. Um, in, a, in a recession, the unemployment rate will rise. This one, um, you know, it's, I, I think the peak in unemployment will vary a lot from state to state, but overall the unemployment rate will probably peak at about 8%. GDP, it's going to be a massive contraction that we've just been through, probably about a 5 to 10% contraction, uh, largest since the 30s. Stocks, well, um, they actually fell 39%, would you believe it, from February the 20th to March the 20th. Um, they've been recovering nicely since then. Um, again, the situation in Melbourne does risk perhaps uh, a bit of a W shape there. Um, but to just summarise that, Normally, I'd leave you with 10 predictions. I'm not quite so confident in this environment, so I'll pick five. Uh, and I've given myself two years to be right rather than one. Uh, so my predictions are simply, um, yes, it's our largest employment shock since the 30s, but it might also be the shortest one, depending on how well we manage the health crisis. 
Uh, we've seen a big V already for the Aussie dollar, for equities. Um, I was leaning towards a V for growth, uh, but I've given reasons as to why it might be a W. Uh, I think we're going to look back in years ahead and regret not taking advantage of dips in uh, asset prices. So I expect it will be the same this time. Um, I do think that demand from Asia, Southeast Asia, not just China, but Korea, Japan and uh, other um, parts of the Asian economy there who are actually performing very well uh, will be supportive for our economy. So important that we diversify and take advantage of those. And at some stage, you know, presumably we'll get a vaccine and we'll be back to worrying about what was troubling us at the start of the year, which was about wages growth and trade wars and, um, and the climate and so on. And in each of those issues, uh, technology and innovation is going to be the solution. So um, it has been a very stressful period. Let's hope that uh, all the restaurants can get back open. Um, again, just with GDP, the fiscal support we've had has been so strong. Um, of 10 to 12 percent of GDP. I think we're going to need more fiscal support, but I'm really pleased the government has stepped up to the plate there. And it's important to note that we had really low levels of government debt going into this crisis, uh, and therefore we could afford to take on more debt. And that's exactly what's happening. Good to borrow when the government can borrow for um, 10 years at 0.9 of a percent. They can borrow for 30 years at one and three quarter percent. So I'm glad that's their strategy. And um, uh, I, I think it'll work. So that's just a really quick quarter hour update and uh, I would welcome any comments or questions. Thank you, David. Um, do we have any uh, questions or comments from uh, anybody? Can I just start by saying um, from a banking point of view, do you see the banks still um, lending over the next 12, 18 months, or do you feel that uh, APRA is going to get involved and tighten things again and um, uh, stop the banks lending? Because we in business feel that that's uh, an important consideration in terms of, you know, not only the survival of our businesses, but growing our business.